Hello and welcome to the New World Review. I'm Grand Line Waifu and today we're looking at episodes 118 and 119 of Hunter Hunter and Becoming Super Saiyans because we're doing a crossover with Kilwa. Episode 118. Where has the time gone? There's a great deal of misunderstandings happening this episode and they're underscored by the moronic behavior of two of the people who are supposed to be protecting the world but who have decided that their pride is more important than the world which again I kind of think should have got them both killed. The amount of time we spent on Knuckles' thoughts lured us into that sense of finality. And of course, they were absolutely reminiscent of Leol's thoughts a few episodes ago, and so I was drawn into it, naturally enraged further to find that none of what he was doing was worth it even to him when he did it. And actually, my complaints last episode that he would learn nothing from it may well bear out, and so I'm doubly enraged. Not quite as angry as UP when he decides to explode, but you know, pretty angry. So we have UP pulling the ultimate switcheroo on Knuckle, who fell into it immediately because he's full of his revenge revenge and idiocy, I guess, and his pride stops him from considering that maybe UP has another way of using the power. Or perhaps that maybe he's an intelligent and competent creature and often that's the way with pride, right? We forget that the other creature might have a sense of competence or that they might just be competent. Except we don't generally decide to kill them when they're obviously stronger and probably smarter. It concerns me that they've all used poor Chameleon to get things done, but now he's picking up on it. Or at least UP. UP is picking up on it. Chameleon is, I mean... Chameleon's fine with being used, but now he's now UP is picking up on it. And for Chameleon's sake, I hope that Kiwa does manage to take UP down. It, it, it's also for my sake, because no one else wears a tracksuit like that Chameleon does. It's a really interesting shift from the beginning of the arc to now, because on the whole, I don't care about the good guys and kind of feel like they deserve to lose. Other than Kiwa, who I want always to win, because he's my sweet little murder baby. Back at the beginning of the arc, I wondered both who the protagonists were and who we were supposed to see as the protagonists because they're sort of two different things. Realistically, back then, maybe I should have made a decision because now I feel like I'm in a place where, of those I've seen, I only want Pito and Kilwa to win, and I feel as though if it were left to them, they would likely win. It's possible they they will win. By win, I mean get what they want, but still. Yupi I'm starting to feel endeared to because he's developing as a character and that's something I personally appreciate in people and entities, of which Yupi is one of them. Gon has decided to remain who he is. Knuckle and Shoot have not only decided to remain who they are, but are willing to bet the world and their own lives on them being who they are. Kiwa is that self-sacrificing alien assassin we all know and love who, like Alf, want to live in their own life, but largely make everyone else's better in the meantime. He doesn't seem to have internal goals just internal conflict and it's interesting to see someone without any particular intention take on the intentions and desires of others as his own with such an intensity. I'd love to see Kilwa decide on what he wants his life to be because ultimately I don't think anyone could stop him or at least once he'd learned to hold the power for you know m m more than more than the amount of time he did. That's the next episode though. Returning to the episode at hand, Poof is on his way out of smoky jail which sort of feels like a cop-out given how powerful Morel's ability have been in the past. I guess it's not that they don't make sense, but that it doesn't feel as narratively interesting as two rather talkative and intuitive characters actually interacting further. It feels like a bit of a waste of both of their abilities, and yes, sure, it's what's needed right now for Knuckle and Shoot to be morons and for Gon to become a monster and for Kilwa to be intensely sulky, but ultimately it feels like we held up these characters and built up tension in this part of the story to deliberately leak it out slowly and painfully. It's not that I don't care what happens to them, but I don't care what happens to them. Said another way, because that doesn't make any sense, I care about the characters. I think they're great and I, they really both give off a bodyguard Jeeves kind of vibe that's fascinating to see interact. But because the whole point is that they're not interacting and that all we're learning is that they respect each other, I'm not sure why we keep coming back to them to continue to learn exactly that same thing. Meanwhile, Ikalgo's doing his thing and it's great that we're seeing what he's up to, his tensions and fears, and I think I've just realized what it is, oh, I've realized what it is that I'm feeling ambivalent, uh, emblem, emblem. I've realized what it is I'm feeling ambivalent about, although I know Liam won't be ambivalent about putting this into the recording. Everything feels rote. Not everything, but some of it. Because the main story isn't in these locations, but we still need to know about them for whatever it is that's going to come later, Tagashi's belaboring the point to inform us of what's happening. Ikelgo looking for people and freaking out is wonderful, but it lacks the tension and tightness of the rest of the episode. The slowness of the story to get it across is necessary, but not the duration. I feel like the whole Ikalgo storyline could have been tightened up, particularly the information given in this episode and when we lean on the narrator to tell us things I kind of get annoyed that the narrator didn't just tell us all of it in less words
words so we could skip to the action. Which might feel like the opposite of what I've said in the past, but the major difference between this and how time has been watched before is that the story's moving forward without developing any of the characters or balancing or managing the tension of the episode. It's kind of hard to explain. Having the narrator tell us something is a lot less interesting than it being shown to us in some way, and I feel that we could have skipped straight to Ikalgo seeing the writing on the wall in Nen, which was the most interesting thing in regard to Thinkabel, then back into the actual story of how he's going to continue the mission. Adding the other captives back to the story was completely irrelevant, or if it's not, no relevance is communicated other than, oh, you might be interested to know, which no, I'm, I'm actually not though. I want to know where Kiwa is, what Yubi's doing, what Poof is doing, and you're wasting time on this, so give me action now. Wow. Even watching Knuckles' thought process, which frankly was moving far too quickly for me to believe it's actually happening, but then I enjoyed his realisation that one thinks quickly when they're about to die, so I'll let it stand, because it made a point. That we had to wait this long for Bravado to step into the lift is another bleh. Episodes ago, we were given a whole lot of information about the effect of the lift. I would be very surprised to find that Togashi planned out any of that. It feels more like a pantsing move where Takashi realizes he's going to have to find a way to get Ikalgo out of trouble and so sends Bravado into the lift. Anyway, let's move on to episode 119 and maybe I'll have a hat to eat at the end or some words to eat or something. I don't know. Episode 119 and we're setting up for Sheila Perf's freedom despite the fact that Morel should have been able to read the situation just a little faster. I know that the whole thing is a little more wibbly wobbly now and that we have to slow things down because thought moves faster than speech and they need to talk things out, but I still get the feeling the scenes with Morel and could have been more economical. Meanwhile, our little murder boy -o became a super Zayn for the first time. I'm not certain why we got the style of art we did for it being described to us. The, um, the strange little, uh, not strange, they just, I don't know what, it, I don't know how to describe it. Like, the, it's Japanese art, like ancient art, like not ancient, but old, like tapestry art? I don't, it's old art. I don't know why we got that. But it's nice to see Kiwa stepping up and showing us what he can do, even if it makes a point that the kids are stronger by far than Knuckle and Shoot, and that he's likely been hiding his time ability from Gon, which I find really interesting. The idea that Kiwa is actually just holding back because Gon wants to feel strong is one that I will endlessly believe to be true. That is my headcanon, you cannot take it from me, it's mine. Since Kilwa's able to do the things he did, I'm as intrigued as Weepy. There's been such a marked not strength in all the combatants so far, I find it fascinating that it's so easy for Kilwa to step up like that. It points to something we tend to ignore when it comes to shows like this, and that's sidekick ability. Beyond Gon and the King, or Gon and Pito, we haven't really needed to see character strength in relative terms for some time. In fact, the last time I recall it happening was volleyball, guy and it, he wasn't really an enemy well wait there was that other guy that wanted to win at cards wait uh, mm, that other guy boom bomb bomb bomber bomber wow this arc is so much weirder than that and i thought that was weird we haven't even seen sulky in a long time and i wonder where the others are where did the phantom troop go is leorio a bug now or honestly i think about that more than i do about bravado who's i mean let's be honest bravado's a hitmonchan blastoise lobster fanboy like it, really what what is going on with all of that poor bro's entire existence is to highlight that actually our Octo Buddy is the most humane character in the series, other than Zushi. Whoa, we're going into all the memories tonight, see? Ikalgo being so humane is seen as a bad thing only in the context of the foolishness Shoot and Knuckle engaged in. I noticed in this episode that Shoot either died or lost consciousness too because the essence de Weepy he took disappeared. So maybe he's gonna be alone in paying for the stupidity of pride. I'm sorry, buddy. It was the other dude. He did it. He didn't save you. Anyway, back to Ikalgo. Ikalgo goes the brains. It makes sense that he and Kilwa would get along, really, given the shared actual thought that goes into the actions they take, which really isn't something any of the others do. Like the ants, everyone but the king works off of instinct, and what we're seeing here is that actually they're all super flawed. Instinct. Don't do it. Don't use instinct. Kilwa and Ikalgo understand the stakes of their situation, but when it comes down to it, they don't just think about themselves. They think about how the whole team needs to be working as a team. It's going to get them both killed. Maybe. Eventually. I just, Kilwa, Camellia, Nicalgo and Morel are trying to do what needs to be done for, you know, the world's benefit. Gon and the two knuckleheads, new band debuting this summer, are failing miserably. Seeing Nicalgo navigate the situation and the environment is a great moral compass for us. To know what an ordinary person would do is always a nice reminder of the things we have at play here and what we should expect. I did, to be honest, get a wave of mild irritation that we switched over to the Nicalgo Bravada storyline because I felt like... I didn't get quite as much of the main story as I wanted before we made that jump. I do understand that
understand that it was narratively necessary though and I was somewhat charmed by the animatedness of the cute plan animation or plan animation as we shall now call it. I like when art styles shift because an art style is designed to communicate a story and communicate emotions and what Togashi has done often is prioritize the story he's trying to tell over whether or not it looks attractive and by and large it's worked in my opinion. Once I learned to appreciate the change in style and storyline I found that it did a pretty good job of holding on to the tension enough while shifting the reason for it. I stayed largely engaged and therefore am quite content with the episode overall. And it is with that contentment that I leave you, because that's it from me. If you enjoyed my rambling meander through arcs and time and all the weird noises I make and questioning everything about this story and its tension grabbing abilities, click here, here, here. Tell people about this, even if it's just in the comments section, I, 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 I'll see you next time.